distinguished scholars, Professor Dr. Rahul Mukherjee, South Asian Institute, Hyderabad University, Dr. Suresh Chandra Chalisi, former NAPJ Ambassador to the United States, and Mr. Vijay Kant Kern, Center for Social Inclusion and Feudalism, Professor Kapil Shrestha, Kathmandu School of Law, Dr. Leela Nyan Chai, Devon University, uh, Dr. Sambudam Sinhara, Devon University, uh, Sanjana Mharjana Matya, Asia Foundation, Dr. Dipu Prakash Bhatt, Member of Parliament of Nepal, Dr. Uddhav Gakrel, Kathmandu University, Jai Nisant, Nepal Democracy Forum, guests, friends from media, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste and good afternoon. It is indeed a privilege to welcome you all at the joint discussion of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement and South Asia Institute, Heidelberg University on the status of democracy in India and Nepal. Before we start, I would like to briefly introduce NICE. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank that believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is implicated. At NICE, we have four research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, non distant Security Studies, Defense <coughs> and Security Studies. It also has eight major research topics, Global Governance, Sustainable Development in Smart Cities, Climate Change and Energy, Disaster Management, International Economy and Development, China's Belt and Road Initiative, Indo-Pacific Affairs, Refugee and Migration, border and transboundary water politics. I'd also like to introduce uh, our co-partner, uh, Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, South Asia Institute, Hyderabad University was established in 1962, and it is of Europe's leading teaching and research institute, focusing on South Asia. Combining seven departments in global humanities and social science, it is an interdisciplinary knowledge exchange platform for faculty, affiliated researchers, and students and we also offer bachelor's and master's course. It aims in to contribute to a better and more integrated understanding of South Asian <coughs> realities, past and present, and to encourage dialogue with policymakers, development practitioners, and other experts. The South Asian Institute house the most comprehensive library of South Asia in Germany, including <coughs> books and journals, manuscripts and maps, and electronic media. In order to improve research facilities and academic network, the South Asian Institute operates four branches office, Colombo in Sri Lanka, New Delhi in India, Islamabad in Pakistan, and Kathmandu in Nepal. The first MOU with Tribune University was signed in, 18, in 1987, and we do celebrate our 35th anniversary of the Kathmandu branch office in Nepal. In the past, NICE has also hosted several leaders, diplomats, experts, and scholars from India and around the world. NICE has hosted several foreign secretaries of at different countries of South Asia, heads of several think tanks, heads of security agencies of different organizations. At NICE, we do follow the status of democracy in South Asia. We have hosted Professor Stephen Krasman of Stanford University to speak on state building and democracy, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, and on the future of democracy in South Asia, and several others from the region. The topic of today is quite relevant as the democracy of South Asia is in decline. Professor Rahul will be talking about the status of democracy in India today. Last night we were talking about how Sheikh Hasina is following the authoritarian path in Bangladesh. We all are aware of the situation of Sri Lanka and Nepal. In all these countries we have elected government who had got huge majority, but what is happening around the region we have seen. Um, there was Modi in India who got huge majority, KP Oli in Nepal, or Gotham in Sri Lanka. They have all got their democracy elected, but the democracy went on decline. Uh, this phenomenon is not new to South Asia. I think similar situation in other parts of the world, which is similar tendency in Trump's America or the many countries of Europe. What we observe that there is a rise of democratically elected autocrats, quote unquote, or autocratic tendencies or autocrats in many. Thus, this new debate are emerging and when we talk about the democratization of democracies. Just being democracy is not enough. Just having elected uh, government elections do not guarantee democracy. Thus, there is a need of a democratization of democratic countries at the moment. I'm sure we all are going to enrich ourselves today through the discussion of eminent scholars today. The first session is a special lecture on Indian democracy by Professor Rahul Mukherjee, Southeast Institute, Hyderabad University, who will be 
discussing about uh, the Indian democracy in detail, and it will be chaired by Dr. Suresh Chandra Chalise, former Nepal ambassador to the United States. The second session we have panel discussion on the status of democracy in Nepal, which will be chaired by Professor Rao himself. Uh, let me invite our chair of the first session, Dr. Suresh Chandra Chalise, former Nepal ambassador to uh, US on the stage. Dr. Suresh Chandra Chalise was the Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at Hyderabad University. He earned his PhD from Banaras Hindu University, India, and undertook postdoctoral research at the University of Dortmund and Geisen, Germany. He served as ambassador to Nepal to the US from 2007 to 2008 and to the United Kingdom from 2010 to 2014, and as Foreign Affairs Advisor to Prime Minister of Nepal from 2006 to 2007, and if affiliated with the Pikwara Foundation for Democracy, Peace and Development in Kathmandu as an independent think tank for promotion of peace, democracy and development. He has published several books and articles. Some of them are Sociology of Legislative Elite in a Development Society, an empirical study based on the member of the first parliament of the Himalayan Kingdom of Nepal at the time after 1990's People's Revolution. Similarly, Women in Politics in Nepal, the Socio-Economic, Health, Legal and Political Constraints in 1996, Coalition Government and Political Accusation in Germany in 1998, and so forth. In addition, he has also contributed several articles at reputed newspapers like the Kathmandu Post, My Republic, and others. Moreover, he has delivered lectures in different national and international conferences. Finally, our guest for today, Professor Dr. Rahul Mukherjee, South Asia Institute, Hyderabad University. We are really thankful, sir, for your time uh, and being here in Nepal with us. Dr. Rahul Mukherjee is a professor and head of Department of Political Science and the executive director of the South Asia Institute at Hyderabad University, Germany. Professor Mukherjee has taught at National University of Singapore, Dawala Nehru University, Hunter College, and University of Vermont. He is also a senior non resident fellow of the Institute of South Asian Studies at National Institute of Singapore and China India workshop at Furan University, Shanghai. Professor Mukherjee served at the board of prestigious journals and has authored Political Economy of Reforms in India, Globalization and Deregulation, Ideas, Interest, and Institutional Changes in India, Policy, Paradigm, and Path Dependence, The Indigenous Roots of Institutional Displacement, and Drift India in the Global Public Policy and Governance, Governing India Evolution of Pragmatic Welfare in Andhra Pradesh, and Democracy versus COVID, India's liberal, illiberal remedy in the Journal of Democracy. This session is of 90 minutes, and I'd like to request the chair to take it off. Over to you, sir. sir. Director of NIIC. Uh, actually, uh, I should also thank him for giving me an opportunity to chair this session, uh, of which uh, the keynote speaker is Dr. Uh, Professor Rahul. He is a well known social scientist, and uh, he's a, I should say, he's a, he's a saluted scholar on South India affairs. So, uh, at chair, now I declare opening of this uh, first session. And uh, before I, uh, you know, uh, invite uh, Professor Rahul uh, to embark on his uh, lecture, I would like to say a few things about him. Because I have had uh, opportunity to work with him also in Heidelberg. He has, at least there are five books to his credit and they all are well received and well acknowledged. They are referred also by many scholars uh, globally. Second thing is that uh, uh, his specialization is on governance, comparative politics and 
political and economic aspect of uh, you know the South Asian phenomenon. So uh, we are very much uh, thankful to this uh, SAI and uh, uh, NICC for uh, having among us uh, a scholar like him. So it is a big opportunity for us also to know what has been happening in this region from um, Professor Rahul. So with these words, now I would like to request uh, Professor Rahul uh, to say what he has to say about uh, India's romance with uh, competitive, uh, uh, competitive uh, authoritarianism or uh, dictatorial tendencies. Please, Rahul, this is, uh, now you can take the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Dr. Chadise. It was indeed a great pleasure and an honor for us to host you at the South Asia Institute. And I personally learned a lot about Nepal from your presence at the Institute. And my sincere thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Jaiswal, who, as you all know better than me, is a live wire in Kathmandu. So it didn't take him many minutes to organize uh, what I can see as a very distinguished gathering here in Kathmandu. Uh, uh, and finally, of course, uh, I think the South Asia Institute uh, must have coordinated very well with Dr. Jaiswal and Heidelberg University was very kind to make me have this trip. Uh, I want to begin this lecture, Mr. Chairman and distinguished guests, by first telling you that I'm as much a learner here as much as a speaker because uh, I'm going to talk about dynamic events in India and I have given a similar lecture in various other South Asian capitals and I'm keen to explore whether the region has similar propensities or tendencies. The whole idea is to understand comparatively South Asian democracy. So it is in that respect that I'm making these remarks. And I'm really looking forward to chairing the next session where I'm hoping to learn a lot, as well as this session and your questions and answers. So to the next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the VDEM rankings, you will quickly realize that three very interesting things are happening in the world. There are countries like Poland and Hungary whose democracies have seemed to have undergone a backslide. And if you look at the 2016 and the 2021 figures, you will clearly agree with what the scholarship is saying, that Poland and Hungary have declined. But both in 2016 and in 2021, if you follow the VDEM rankings, you will find that India uh, has had a higher rank, which means that it has a lower place. India and Sri Lanka, as you know, are very respected, historically founded democracies in South Asia. And you find that both India and Sri Lanka are very close to each other in the rankings. However, India seems to be a little bit lower than Sri Lanka, which means it has a higher rank. What, however, is very surprising in these rankings, and I'm not asking you to believe these rankings, uh, but the world does, is that Nepal and Bhutan, the two countries which are considered to be fledgling democracies, uh, both of which might have interacted with India in order to consolidate their democracies, are actually doing better than India in terms of the rankings. So both Nepal and Bhutan, which had a higher rank than India in 2016, now have a lower rank than India in 2021. Pakistan always had a very low rank, but it seems to be where it was. It's neither doing too well, nor is it doing too badly. Clearly, it's doing not as well as Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. And what's really interesting for a South Asia scholar is that Bangladesh, 
uh, is almost where Turkey is. So when you look at comparative democracy, you have to be clear about the fact that Turkey is not Poland, is not Hungary. Even though a lot of academic writing in comparative politics now uh, you know, mentions Turkey, Poland and Hungary in the same breath. And clearly, India is not doing as well as Poland and uh, Hungary, but is certainly doing better than Bangladesh. Uh, that's something to be worried about. So now, moving on to my presentation on India. The next slide, please. You will find that, believe it or not, India's democracy has undergone a decline and we will talk a little bit about the reasons for that decline. Having undergone that decline, nevertheless, India's democracy is not completely lost. So I will make these two propositions very clearly before I say a few more words about the nature of India's decline. So first and foremost, you have to understand that uh, the BJP and the RSS have found a center stage in the Indian firmament, which means that there are attacks on the secular nature of the Indian constitution. And these attacks can be made very easily because it has a brute majority in the parliament. The Congress party doesn't even have enough seats to have a leader of the opposition. Now, if you want to learn more about the Congress decline, which I'm sure is helping what we call Hindutva nationalism, then you can read a blistering piece that I wrote in the Hindu on the 11th of August, 2022. Uh, no, I think this piece was written on the yeah 11th of August, 2022. There's a link to this piece and it's also linked in my official website. So what are really the problems in the Congress party? First and foremost is the fact that Mr. Rahul Gandhi's leadership has not succeeded. While his leadership has not succeeded, he has not accepted the position of the presidency of the Congress party, while he seems to be calling the shots. And there are many examples of very, very foolish political maneuvers performed by Mr. Rahul Gandhi, which are really an advantage for the BJP. I also mention in that piece that Mr. Rahul Gandhi suffers from a kind of a problem that neither Mrs. Sonia Gandhi nor Dr. Manmohan Singh nor Jawaharlal Nehru ever suffered from. Each charismatic leader, each governance personality had a very good political manager to work with. So Jawaharlal Nehru had Sadar Patel, of course he was charismatic, he was a great leader. Uh, even Mrs. Sonia Gandhi had Ahmed Patel to work with. Dr. Manmohan Singh had Ahmed Patel to work with. So Dr. Manmohan Singh was doing good governance and Mr. Ahmed Patel, not very well known to the political class, was actually managing the affairs of the Congress party. The current political managers, however, have not been able to play that role. And in my blistering piece, which is noted in this slide, I had mentioned the name of Mr. Ashok Gehlot as a possible choice. And if we read the news today, and much after my piece was published, it seems that Mr. Gehlot will contest, uh, maybe for the first time, a truly political election for the presidency of the Congress party, and he's a real politician. So the Congress is in decline. There's a lot of room for opposition. It's been hit very badly. I think the BJP wants to destroy the Congress party. I mean, the ideology of the RSS is fairly in contradistinction to the idea of India, either Ala Nehru or Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose or Mohandas Khan. And I can debate why. Despite these, you know, propensities, the fact of the matter is that you will see many states on this map with a B sign inside of those states. And those are the states that are being ruled by the BJP in power. Consequently, you will also find that there are many states that don't have a B on the map. 
And this implies that unlike Bangladesh, opposition parties can stand up and can win elections in India, rankings apart. So even in the state of Delhi, the BJP has not been able to win the legislature. Recently, it was unable to win the legislative elections in West Bengal. You know, if you're following India, how the Shiv Sena Congress NCP combined was toppled by the BJP recently uh, in a very <laughs> peculiar manner. Uh, but one can see why the BJP wants Maharashtra because it's the richest state in India, right? So there is resilience. Opposition parties can stand and win elections. And the second and even more attractive way of understanding the nature of the Indian people and their capacity to protest is the very historic farmers movement that took place recently. I don't want to get into the details of the farm bills because it will take time. Be that as it may, what the farm bills were trying to promote was in clear contradistinction to what the powerful farmers in Punjab, Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh wanted. So for about one year there was no consultation and under very adverse circumstances and under conditions where the farmers were almost being discredited as anti-nationals, these farmers stood together in the neighborhood of Delhi, sometimes three, four hundred thousand of them, always a big number. They almost created parallel cities. They were able to duck the intelligence agencies. They were able to do it syncretically, inviting all religious denominations. And finally, the Prime Minister relented. You know, he's a good political manager, or his political managers told him that you have to withdraw the bills. And the bills were withdrawn, and uh, the BJP won elections in Uttar Pradesh. So the fact that India's society has the capacity to rise above, let's say, political uh, hegemony uh, was shown in brilliant manner. But what was tragic here is that none of the major political parties in the opposition could actually connect with the movement and politically gain from it. So the problem really is not entirely with the ruling party, it is as much with the opposition. Now very briefly, I want to explicate or quickly mention, next slide please, three different pathways through which an electorally autocratic regime is being constructed. Pathway number one is what I call, following the literature on historical institutionalism, as drift. Drift happens when you don't change any laws, you don't change any rules, but you just interpret them differently. Drift is a very politically convenient action when there is a lot of political opposition. And it is also very convenient when the rules are somewhat ambiguous. So you can actually interpret them differently. However, following the same rules, behavior changes radically in the direction of the idea that you want to promote. And I will talk about the idea in the next slide. But let's see what we are drifting towards. The Indian Parliament in the 15th Lok Sabha discussed 70% of its bills within standing committees. This was 2009 to 14. The standing committees of the Indian Parliament had over time become a very respected bipartisan institution with very, very expert members of Parliament coming, debating, arguing, proposing. And then when such propositions were made, bipartisan support would come. So in the, in the 15th Lok Sabha, 2009 to 14, 70% of the bills were discussed. In the 16th Lok Sabha, 2004 to 19, only 27% were discussed. And after the BJP's majority became even more brute, only 13% of the bills were discussed. So obviously, some of the bills that were not discussed were the farm bills as well. 
which were repealed after they had been enacted. So this tells you that even though the party has a brute majority, it has much less propensity to discuss. You know, if, <laughs> if I am a hegemonic party, you know, why would I not discuss? I would show some generosity, right? I would make the system look even more democratic. But there is some kind of a fear that, you know, these things should not be discussed, even when there is a brute majority. I give you another example, and that is in the judiciary. There are at least three important issues which are pending before the Supreme Court, where important public interest litigations have been made, arguing that they violate the Indian Constitution. I will talk a little bit about electoral bonds. I will talk a little bit about the abrogation of Article 370, which converted Kashmir from a special state into a union territory. And I will talk perhaps not much about the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now, these three and other acts have been enacted. Governance is happening on the basis of these. All of these were enacted in 2018 and 19. But the Supreme Court, which is willing to take up the case of a loyalist the very next day, if, it, if required, is unwilling to make a judgment on these three acts, uh, with whether or not they violate the Constitution. So once again, you can see, the judiciary is actually performing the same constitution. But the same judiciary, which had made itself very popular for human rights and democracy, is now behaving in a very peculiar fashion. And we would call this drift. My final example is the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act. The Foreign Contributions Regulation Act is a present that the Congress government gave to the BJP. Every five years, the foreign contributions license had to be renewed by the government of India. And I must say that the way in which the Congress government performed the Foreign Contributions uh, Regulation Act uh, was not very honorable. So between 20, 2009 and 14, about 4,000 NGOs lost their licenses under the Congress regime. But the same figure between 20, uh, 2014 and 2019 was 16,679 NGOs. Now this is drift, right? It's the so Foreign Contributions Regulation Act was given to us in 2010, became admissible in 2011, and until 2020, the BJP government did not amend that act. But more than 16,500 NGOs were deprived of their license to use foreign funds. So the scale was slightly less than 4,000 NGOs until 2014. And now it became slightly less than 17,000 NGOs. So you find that the same act was weaponized to a greater extent. Now, finally, you found that the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act of 2010-2011 was amended in 2020. Conceptually, I call this layering. And what is the difference between drift and layering? Drift is that you don't have to change any laws. Layering is change the law incrementally. Don't change it radically, but just change it incrementally. And when this incremental change was performed, you now had to restrict your administrative cost using foreign funds to 20% of foreign funds. What was 50% in the past was reduced to 20%. Which means that foreign funded NGOs are now being encouraged to do more work like making toilets and producing COVID vaccine uh, on people rather than doing research and advocacy. Second, you know, NGOs we found could also be cancelled within the five year period. 
So Oxfam as an NGO was cancelled. Earlier, you know, you could be renewed and not renewed. Uh, so Oxfam, sorry, Oxfam was not renewed yeah. in recent times. But the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiatives, uh, foreign <laughs> contributions permission was actually cancelled. Uh, and, and the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, if you go into the details of that NGO, doesn't do any radical work which can be called Maoist or anti-democratic. Another major way of weaponizing the old act in a layered way was to create a provision where earlier an FCRA NGO could subgrant to another FCRA NGO. So I am Oxfam, I'm working with a smaller NGO somewhere in West Bengal. I could give a five crore grant if both NGOs had FCRA clearance. Now it was said that one FCR NGO cannot subgrant to another. So this means that either that guy who cannot write proposals to get money will have to close shop, or she or he becomes a part of a bigger NGO. And most devastatingly, especially at the time of COVID, when a lot of NGOs actually had performed very good work when the government actually did not make a lot of resources available for the lockdown, it was said that every NGO which has a foreign contribution must locate that foreign contribution in the State Bank of India branch in Parliament Street. Which gives the government a very good idea of who is funding whom. Much easier to collect the data than if it was to be placed <laughs> with different banks being regulated in different parts of the country. And as a result of this, the government has come out with a black list of funding organizations, like the Open Society Foundation, like the Ford Foundation. And often when NGOs lose these clearances, people are debating about why that happened. And somebody would say, oh, they were getting funds from Ford. Oh, they were getting funds from Open Society. The result of all this has been that there's been a radical reduction in foreign contributions of civil society actors. Next slide, please. Uh, no, uh, we, we, we are still with layering, right? So this is so this is this is what I call layering. You know, you've you've now actually changed uh, the legislation a little bit. If you look at the case of electoral bonds, you will find that the Indian electoral funding situation was already very murky. But the electoral bonds provision creates an even murkier situation. You can buy bonds worth 10,000, 1 lakh, 1 crore, uh, and in those denominations from the State Bank of India. Donors are supposed to be anonymous. But it is not clear to us whether donors can be anonymous if the bonds are located in the hands of the State Bank of India. We also know that 70 to 90 percent of these bonds are going to the BJP. So when so much money is flowing into the ruling party, obviously the amount of money left with the opposition is much less. And quasi-legal activities that were performed on both sides are now only being performed on one side because, you know, the kinds of collections that produced uh, the arrest of a minister in the West Bengal cabinet. Uh, those kinds of quasi-legal co collections were happening across the board. Now the BJP and the RSS are flushed with funds and therefore uh, it's much easier to catch cash in the hands of others. But what is even more interesting about electoral bonds is that earlier only 7.5% of corporate profits could go into electoral funding. Now that limit has been removed. And you could easily be a foreign company that opens a shell company in India and contributes whatever you like to any party inside of the country. So these are some very disconcerting events. Again, I would call electoral bonds as layering because uh, there's been a change in policy and law. Uh, it's been challenged in the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has not ruled. Obviously, it's a very powerful case made by Common Cause and the Association of Democratic Rights. And finally, 
you will completely displace institutions when the political opposition is weak. Uh, I don't want to enter into the merits of whether <laughs> you know, Muslims should be treated badly because after all, Hindu, India is a Hindu country. But obviously, the moral purpose of a special state of Jammu and Kashmir was because of the fact that it was a Muslim majority state. And what the abrogation of Article 370 has done is that it has con converted a special state into two union territories. A union territory is much more directly under central government rule than a normal state in India. So you really completely transform the moral purpose of the state. And what are these two union territories? The union territories of Ladakh, which has a slightly greater Buddhist population than the Muslim population, and the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, which has a Muslim majority. And having created that union territory, you are now delimiting legislative districts in such a way that Jammu's proportions are increasing, which has a Hindu majority, and Kashmir's proportions are decreasing. So I call this a kind of institutional displacement, and I've tried to explain to you three modalities. Uh, drift, you don't have to change any rules, you just perform them differently. Layering, you change them incrementally. And displacement, you just take a whip and spank the rule. Next slide, please. So all of this, I argue, and I have argued in the piece in the Journal of Democracy, looking at the way in which COVID management was performed, actually leads to what Levitsky and Way in the book uh, I think called the death of democracy or something like that, called competitive authoritarianism. Com competitive authoritarian regimes are not authoritarian regimes. They are democratic regimes. But what competitive authoritarian regimes do is that they allow political leaders to come to power with an electoral majority. And using this electoral majority, they deploy methods to make it more and more and more difficult for opposition to rise. So it's not like opposition cannot rise, and I showed you in an earlier slide that there are opposition parties, right? But various institutional adjustments are made in such a way that it becomes difficult for them to rise. And I think the idea that is behind the performance of this competitive authoritarian regime are attacks both on the pluralism of the state as well as pluralism within society. So if you look at the way in which the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act was performed, or if you look at the way in which I have not talked about the media, uh, there are attacks on society. But if you look at electoral bonds, if you look at the way in which the election commission is performing, and if you look at a variety of other things like the abrogation of Article 370, uh, the way in which the Supreme Court is performing, then you find that there are attacks on the plural nature of the state itself. Because a democratic state which has plural institutions can actually produce checks and balances on the executive. So the joke was during Dr. Manmohan Singh's time that he was a very weak prime minister. Uh, the Supreme Court denied, I think, more than 100 telecom licenses after the 2G scam against the wishes of the prime minister. And everybody was saying that the Supreme Court has become very powerful and that was looked down upon, which is why India needed a strong leader, right? Now India has a strong leader, but the chief justices, are either silent or are making uh, judgments that are quite interesting. Certainly not uh, the flavor of the day that was before the BJP came to power. Next slide, please. Uh, so if you, 
I mean, I have a piece in the Journal of Democracy, which is titled, I think, COVID versus Democracy, an illiberal remedy. And there I show very clearly how the parliament was undermined in COVID management. Lots of leaders in the opposition wanted to have a debate on how lockdown can happen. But if you just look at the parliamentary debates, that was never allowed. And all of a sudden, on the 24th of March 2020, a lockdown was performed with very few financial resources for people who will be afflicted in the lockdown. And this was despite the fact that scientists from the Indian Council of Medical Research had published pieces in the Indian Journal of Medical Research which had suggested that a pure lockdown will not work. It has to be a different kind of lockdown. Uh, it cannot, you can't just have a complete lockdown like the one that was performed. And as you know at that time, millions of people lost their lives. They got up on trucks, they walked, they cycled back to their homes because there was no way for them to live uh, for migrant laborers in the metropolitan cities where they worked. I'm sure there were people from Nepal also who suffered from the lockdown. I've already mentioned to you the instrument of electoral bonds. If electoral bonds becomes a way for the ruling party to garner more funds, then the opposition, uh, in a legal and nice way, obviously it's going to promote competitive authoritarian propensities. Then I have also mentioned to you the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act, where it seems that NGOs largely working in the area of welfare, in the area of secularism, with lower caste Dalit populations are being hit. So I'll just give you two stories. You know, I was recently, Oxfam was raided by the IT department. <laughs> A little after, you know, it lost its FCRA. So between the time that it was raided by the IT department and it lost its FCRA license, uh, it seemed to me that the executive director of, the, of Oxfam was worried that, you know, now he has to work with very little or no money, uh, but, you know, still kept a straight face. And some of the people in Oxfam felt that maybe there were two reasons. One was the way in which Oxfam wrote reports that highlighted the misery of migrant labor uh, and sort of gained worldwide attention. And the second, my, of course, these things are anti-national, right? If you, if you criticize your country abroad, then you're an anti-national. Then the second is, I think, their attempt to work for tea plantation laborers who, uh, who were living under not such good conditions. And how that was opposed by the tea plantation owners who were closer to the RSS. I mean, these are just hypothetical statements, nobody can be sure, but FCRA clearance was denied. And that was not it. Uh, recently, uh, and all of this is in the news, I'm not saying anything <laughs> which is confidential, it's all in public knowledge. Uh, uh, the Center for Policy Research, where I actually began, which was my first job after I came back with a PhD from Columbia University in 1999 went through an IT survey. It was not called a raid, uh, but it seems that a lot of people inside the Center for Policy Research were supposed to be kept inside while the survey was going on. And at the same time, the, uh, the Oxfam people also had an IT survey. And I have it from the Oxfam executive director that for 36 hours he was like, in his office. And he was asked, he was allowed to go to the loo in his house once uh, under a condition where he would not meet his family members. But it was only a survey. There's no, it was not like, uh, it was not like a IT enforcement directorate raid which is performed under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So the point I'm trying to make is that all kinds of instruments are being used and uh, in nuanced ways. Then, of course, there is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which, using an amendment in the Finance Act of 2019, enables the Enforcement Directorate of the Ministry of Finance to go and search 
any person. It could be an NGO leader like Harsh Mandar, uh, it could be Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi have just been questioned. But the Prevention of Money Laundering Act is a penal act. You could be in prison for uh, if, and, and sort of this is one like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act is not bearable. The Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which was legislated in 2002, was actually meant for money launderers who were rich people, you know, capitalists. But now it is being directed against opposition politicians as well as civil society organizations. And then, of course, there is the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which was amended in 2019, where an earlier version of the act was amended in such a way that to claim that someone is a terrorist, you don't have to link that person to a group. So a certain kind of people could be uh, taken on the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. And the most uh, interesting example of that uh, was the death of a Jesuit priest called Stan Swami, who at the age of 83 was picked up. I can tell you what he was doing when he was picked up, but I won't bore you with that story right now. <laughs> but he was an 83-year-old Jesuit priest who was uh, taken to prison, and uh, it seems that there were many comforts that he could have been provided in prison which were not afforded, and he died in prison before being convicted. So uh, these are some of the uh, the final slide, please. Uh, I. I don't want to belab belabor these points too much because I'm sure you have questions and I have sort of tried to give you a conceptual view of how I see the trajectory and how we can classify it into files. So one of the files is drift, another file is layering and the third file is displacement. These are all mechanisms of institutional change in a competitive authoritarian direction. But what are the ideas that are performing these mechanisms or pathways? In my view, and I'm happy to learn from you if there are more or if there are less, there are two leading ideas. One is attacking pluralism inside society and the other is attacking the pluralist nature of the state itself. The parliament, the Supreme Court, the Election Commission, there is a lot of debate about center-state financial relations. A lot of states are very unhappy with the way in which financial allocations are being made by the center. I have talked about electoral bonds, and I have talked about the abrogation of Article 370. Uh, much of what you see in this slide has already been talked about, uh, except that I should mention that the farm bills were repealed. So the so as a social movement could perform itself, which led to the repeal of three bills. So the institutional displacement was not performed. And then there was, in terms of layering and attacking uh, social action, the creation of a new fund called PM Cares in 2020. Again, after the parliament was shut down, there was already a Prime Minister's Relief Fund that was accountable to the right to information. But another fund was created called PM Cares, which was not accountable to the right to information. And this fund was not made accountable on the grounds that it is a private trust. However, PM Cares was lodged as a very, very significantly generous way of contributing to COVID relief because it had all the tax concessions that you needed to get. Uh, PM Cares was able to get the kinds of tax concessions, for example, that the Chief Minister's Relief Funds did not get at the state level. So these are a few ways in which I think that the Indian state, which is still democratic, which certainly has social movements. Uh, as you know, Prime Minister Modi is a product of that democracy, uh, is 
is struggling with at this point in time. So I look forward to your comments and your critical comments. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Professor Rao, for your radiant, I say, it's a radiant point of view as to how India is uh, gradually drifting away from its democratic values. Uh, I'm sure that uh, after hearing him, uh, uh, we must have generated some curiosity among us. And uh, I'm also one of them, one of you, I mean. Uh, and my first uh, curiosity about your point of view is that uh, in spite of argument or allegations that uh, under this BJP government, India is deviating from democratic uh, tradition, how could you see, Professor Rahul, that, uh, okay, fine, uh, India is drifting away from democratic uh, convention, but what about economic aspect? We came to know recently that uh, India has exalted its position economically at the global level from sixth uh, largest economy of the world to fifth largest economy. How, how do you see it? The, after this question, you know, you, you, any of you, if you have your curiosity, you can uh, raise your hands. I, to take this question first, I think, I think uh, this could be, you know, the curiosity for others also. However, I have done some work on the political economy of India. Um, recently, the Indian economy has grown. I think that's, that's been a good news. But you have to understand that the Indian contraction was one of the worst contractions. Uh, if you look at unemployment figures, they're very high, among the highest in many decades. Uh, I've been looking at the balance of payments figures. Of course, India is not in a situation like Sri Lanka today, but uh, India's uh, balance of payments, uh, surpluses have also declined quite drastically within the last one year. Uh, so I do think that there's a lot of encouragement for corporates within this government. And as you know, one of the corporates has become the second richest man in the world uh, in a matter of, no, this is Mr. Adani. In fact, Mr. Ambani is probably feeling jealous now because uh, uh, Mr. Adani, who was worth something like 5 or 6 billion in 2014, is certainly over 130 billion today. And uh, there's a lot of infrastructure assets. So, for example, uh, recently you might have heard a controversy in Sri Lanka about uh, an infrastructure asset that went to the Adani's. I have also, uh, to the Adani's. So, uh, but uh, be, it, be that as it may, Adani's or Ambani's, <coughs> Uh, maybe there's some special preference for Mr. Adani, but uh, there's a lot of benefit for the corporate sector in this government. I think that the problem really is that India still probably has more poor people than sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and, you know, you see, India was the third largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity even six or seven years ago when I was teaching. You know, I, uh, this is nothing new. And purchasing power parity is is the way to measure the size of an economy rather than nominal GDP. Because, you know, if I, if I looked at what Indian rupees converted to dollars can buy in India, uh, uh, you know, it would be, let's say, if I would look at what Indian rupees could buy in the US, right, it would be much less than what Indian rupees, the same number of Indian rupees could buy in India, right? So that is why economists perform something called purchasing power parity, that they equalize for spending. And in terms of purchasing power parity, India had uh, become the third largest economy in the world. As you know, around 2006, 7 India's growth rate even exceeded China's. We haven't really seen that kind of an economic growth under the present dispensation. And this, on this, I think every economist would agree uh, that, uh, that 
even the growth rates have not been great, but the recent growth rate has been quite good, building on a large contraction. Uh, so I think the problem of rapid economic growth had been solved by Manmohan Singh and Chidambaram even before this government came to power. And after that, actually, the growth rates dipped a little bit. Not as much as during the COVID, and therefore comparisons are difficult, because we don't know how the Congress government would have dealt with COVID, right? We know that the, that the current government dealt very badly with COVID, and India actually had a huge contraction, even by global standards. From there, you know, you've had... So I wouldn't... I mean, I, I do think that this is a pro-corporate sector government, which might have a positive impact on the, on the growth rate of the economy. When I look at the data right now, I am not convinced that those rates of growth have yet come to exceed what the UPA government or what the Vajpayee government achieved. Uh, the Vajpayee government actually achieved uh, rapid rates of economic growth. Uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really, uh, you know, for me that, that rank is, is not a very great thing because I mean, every economy grows. India is growing with 1.4 billion people. You know, Germany has 88. Nepal has probably 40, 50, right? So if you look at combined GDP with a certain amount of growth rate, it has produced a large economy, which is why India was invited to the group of eight countries, group of 20 countries, recently also in the G7 meeting. So there's no question that the Indian economy is a very important economy, and there's no question that Whoever might be the Prime Minister of India cannot be ignored. But I will not classify that as being something even as spectacular as what Mr. Vajpayee achieved in the previous vision. Yeah. Thank you. And please introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, Professor Rao. Uh, this is Pranab. Uh, I have uh, an observation and a question. Uh, two dates in Indian uh, democratic history are important according to me. So 1947 was one and 2014 is another. And if I borrow Pratap Bhanuv Mehta's word, then 2014 uh, sort of initiated the new republic. Huh. So in that context, uh, I'd like to ask you, how do you see the resurgence of the one-party dominance system in India? Which is again, uh, Suhas Palsikar putting it that way. So, uh, because BJP seems to be having a very good machinery at winning elections, but its recorded governance, even the so-called Gujarat model, is, is, is a problematic one. So how do you see this winning streak, election winning streak, because Continuously, it has been winning, and uh, at least at the national level. But uh, on the governance front, as you've also highlighted some aspects, it's 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 uh, faulty, if I may put it. So, how do you s see this contradiction? Thank you. Uh, excellent question. I must uh, <laughs> I must preface my remarks by saying that Pratap is a good friend, and in 2014, he thought that Prime Minister Modi will solve all the problems of India. I invited him for a, for a keynote address to the National University of Singapore, and he called it the Modi model. Uh, at that time, I was also more optimistic about Prime Minister Modi, but not as optimistic as Tata Bhanu Mehta, because, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have a very good uh, feeling about Godra, even though I'm a devout Hindu. Um, so, I... And they were, we were having this debate over dinner at our place. And then what happened was that after a couple of years, from being very close to Mr. Modi, he lost his vice chancellorship at the Ashoka University. And then at that time, he called me and asked me whether we could accommodate him in Heidelberg. Uh, then he lost his professorship at the university. And now he is a visiting, he's a, he has a five month position in Princeton. So, Pratap has literally swung from viewing Mr. Modi as uh, <laughs> the, the, the deliverer of all uh, problem solutions to being somebody who got so critical that he could not even keep his job inside the country. 
Uh, at one time, he was asking me to resign from my position and join Ashoka University as a professor. Uh, I am not as critical as Pratap in terms of looking at the future of Indian democracy. I, I tend to agree with you that, uh, that a lot of governance successes are actually not as they are made out to be. And, and that's a problem. But there are also governance successes. Like the government has really learned to target benefits. And this targeting of benefits is having a huge impact on election results. And you have to give the BJP, the current BJP regime credit for that. But uh, as I was telling Dr. Chalise, I'm not so optimistic about the growth rates yet. I'm certainly concerned about the fact that a few industrialists or one industrialist is coming to dominate the sector, which is not the way in which competitive markets in capitalist systems perform for the consumer. So I have done some work on telecoms that shows even how Mr. Ambani was preferred, so that he has Geo now, which has exceeded Airtel by about by 10%. So Airtel is about 30% of the market. Geo is now about 40% of the market. Of course, the Adani story is even more legendary. Like uh, it's almost like uh, <laughs> you know, Adani has to. And and then there will be more benefits for the corporate sector. But but I do think that despite all of these things, as I did point out to you, that India's democracy is not dead. Uh, and if the opposition does not stand up, you can't just blame Mr. Modi. Uh, that's why you should read my piece in The Hindu, which was a direct attack. I mean, I wrote two pieces. One was on civil society, which was a direct attack on the state. And the second one was on the Gandhi family. Because I'm sure there are many people within the BJP who would want a stronger opposition. And uh, if this opposition is not able to perform, that's a real problem. Now, how will the opposition rise? Uh, I really don't have the answer. I mean, uh, it seems that the current Bharat Jodo Yatra of Rahul Gandhi is a little bit better than what I have described him in my article in the Hindu. Uh, the, if Mr. Ashok Gehloth becomes the president of the Congress party, I certainly think that it will be a, a great thing for the opposition because at least foolish self-side goals which uh, actually hurt the Congress party will not be made by the party itself. Uh, whether or not Mr. Gehloth, if he becomes president, he will be able to muster enough political acumen to deal with the BJP as it is, is another question. But certainly, if under the conditions of such crisis, the Congress party gets a president who's a political manager and works with some people who do not do foolish things, I'm not saying that the BJP will lose tomorrow, but the nature of politics will change. Because you have to understand that India has only two national parties. In the past, it was Congress dominance. Now, it is BJP dominance. Do not think that one party dominance is new. You know, a lot of people like to give all the problem credit to Rahul Gandhi. I won't, because, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru from 1947 and then later after that, till about 1966, the Congress party was winning all the elections in the parliament and in the states. And until 1977, in the parliament. But the practice of democracy could have easily become like the practice of democracy in Singapore, right? Where the People's Action Party has never lost elections. Somehow India performed and worked with institutions even under you know, single party dominance, uh, which are, I think, being eroded in a competitive authoritarian manner. But the practice of this democracy has some foundations. And Mr. Modi himself is a product of that system, right? So I won't, I won't sort of be a Pratap Bhanu Mehta and say that, you know, one day Mr. Modi was solving all the problems, today, you know, he is all the problems. I would right. now make it a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Sorry. I'm Kapil Swasta, Professor of Political Science and Human Rights. Uh, thank you very much for a very objective and uh, very interesting talk on India. As a matter of fact, uh, we in Nepal have been very closely observing 
is political, social, and even economic, and uh, international relations, development related to international relations in India. And what worries us must is this alarming transformation in the nature characteristics, fabric of once vibrant and democratic, democratic politics in India. India in the past, as you have said, uh, uh, like my um, professor, Professor Rajni Pathari used to say single party dominance way back in 60s itself. And, but then India used to exercise, enjoy some kind of soft power. And well, the Western countries like United States and other Western powers may not agree with India on many respects, but it still used to respect India's peace. But now under Modi and under RSS, yeah. India, I'm afraid, what like some critics often say, India has become Hindu Pakistan. <laughs> or even say that religion has been used as a weapon. And you can see this unprecedented increase in intolerance and because and now that uh, we are hearing that RSS and BJP is exporting these things uh, outside India as well, in countries where large number of Indians are living a domicile. So you can see the, the impact of India-Pakistan cricket and Leicester Sire in UK and several other countries. So you, you can see this militancy, sudden militancy. And so this has created crisis of trust among Indian politicians. And uh, yesterday, I think the day before yesterday, I was reading a small comment by Kapil Sibo, mm -hmm. a senior politician, a lawyer, um, close to Congress party in India. I don't know whether he's in Congress or not now. No, he's resigned. Yeah, because many people are resigning from Congress. That but he didn't join the BJP. Did he join? No, no he has not joined. And so, he won't join either. Well, our friend here can tell you. No, <laughs> we have, we have an insider here. So, <laughs> he, had, he had said that we are living in a constant share of the state. Yeah, yeah right. because this uh, like state investigative agencies, state <clears throat> and the police. So, in such atmosphere, and now that you can see uh, India's double standard, double standard in Ukraine, in, we will say, even Myanmar, Burma, and even many issues on Nepal as well. Yes. So, how India this trajectory is going to evolve and how it is, once you say recently, no, we have, so how it is likely to influence the development or say evolution of democracy in India, as you have said that, you see, India is no longer free. In past, Nepal is used to flee to India to enjoy some free air. But now I'm afraid Indians would do that otherwise. Come to Nepal, do enjoy the fear. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, com compared to India, we feel Nepal. Compared to the fear. Which is what I want to hear from you in the next session. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I think yeah. maybe I'll quickly take this one and then I'll because thank you very much, Professor Shrestha, for making it work for the panel and for my lecture. Your reputation precedes you, although we have not met. Uh, let me say a couple of things about India. And I would like the BJP and the RSS to hear it as well. I am myself very profoundly impacted by the writings of Swami Vivekananda. Mm -hmm. And I think he no, you do are. and I think he made some of the most cosmopolitan arguments yes. regarding the Catholicity of all religions. I won't get into a lecture on that, I can. 
his first speech at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago actually mentioned that very clearly. And if you go into the tradition of, let's say, India, even going before that to a man called Kabir Das, Kabir Das became a disciple of Ramananda Acharya, who was one of the great Bhakti saints. And it was Muslims who actually preserved the life and teachings of Ramananda Acharya. So in order for Kabir Das to become a disciple of Ramananda Acharya, he just laid down on the ghat in Varanasi one day. And Ramananda Acharya stepped on him and he said, Hey Ram. And Kabir Das said that you have given me my mantra. And the teachings of Kabir Das are in the Guru Granth Sahib as well. If you read the Dohas of Kabir Das, forget about Islam. You can't, sometimes he's a dualist, sometimes he's a non dual Advait Vadi. So, our culture actually has so many debates of a philosophical nature, tracing their era to ancient times. Such ancient times the world has not seen. And we don't read that philosophy. That there is a DNA, there is a gene. It is not like Gandhi came and suddenly, you know, he became no. cosmopolitan. Okay. It is not like Kabir <laughs> suddenly said, I want to become. So now, when you assassinate Gandhi, why do you assassinate Gandhi? You assassinate Gandhi because he's considered to be very, very softward Muslims, right? Of course, the man who assassinated also had some commitment. After all, he gave up his life, right? But it is two ideas in conflict. One idea is saying that India has suffered because, and that is the RSS idea, because India has so many streams, it has so many different philosophies that we don't know who is a Hindu. And, and they are right, they are not wrong. Because some aspects of Hindu tradition, philosophically will be very close to Islam. You just remove the term Allah and you will find similarity. Some aspects would be very close to Sufi Islam. And I think that the reason why India gave unto itself its constitution, which says Sarva Dharma Sama Bhava, it is not like the French constitution. It doesn't say that the religion and the state have to be, but Sarva Dharma Sama Bhava, equal Bhava towards every religion, is, act of, is a product of an Indian culture. Now, this aspect or attitude in Indian culture today is attacked institutionally in a very profound way. At the same time, when the Congress Party, because of its own mistakes, has completely devastated itself. So what was the RSS when Gandhiji was assassinated? What is the RSS today? What was the Congress Party then? What is it today? Now, I really don't have an answer to your question, but I will ask this question to Mr. Modi or to the head of the RSS, that can you kill a 10,000 year old tradition? You know, when the Chinese party penetrates every aspect of Chinese life, it is consistent with Confucian tradition. You know, they can do it more naturally. You know, when a Tiananmen Square happens, we don't even know whether 10,000 were killed or 50,000 were killed, but the very next day, not a drop of blood was seen. Can Indians do that? Now, we are, <laughs> we are in that moment where we have to discover, and certainly there is a conflict between these two traditions. And I think the tradition that is trying to propagate itself is a very new one. It was actually born in Europe. <laughs> and therefore, we will have to see, and I am hopeful, that 10,000 years of Indian history will not be washed away in the Ganges by a hundred years of history. So I am, in the long run, I will, I will not, you know, when, when Mrs. Gandhi performed the emergency, who thought that she will lose the election? She did, right? And Mr. Modi is not completely undermining democracy, right? So now the opposition has to come together. And Mr. Modi is also a politician. When he was chief minister of Gujarat, he used to talk about a more federal system. Now as prime minister, he's trying to reduce the federal system. So if required, you know, he can repeal the farm laws. He can 
And I'm sure there are many debates even within the BJP. So for example, Mr. Mohan Bhagwat met some Muslim leaders and people are trying to interpret, you know, what was it. So it's, India has the kind of diversity that Europe does not have. Can you turn it into a nation state like Germany or France? Well, it doesn't have that. That, that is the answer to your question. Yeah. And diversity, which India does. Uh, Professor, uh, Samburam Sinkara is my name. Uh, absolutely brilliant talk. And of course, I absolutely concur and sympathize with you that uh, India is too diverse. It is too old at civilization for any one episode of political process or leader to really turn that wave around. Nonetheless, you referred to uh, the rise of Modi. And of course, Modi won. Do you remember uh, when, he, when Modi rose for the first time in the national scene? Many Indian scholars were giving him the name like the Abe of India yes. or the Begin of India. Absolutely. I wrote a piece saying, look, India needs its own place in the global high table, and Modi has, should have his own name. And the point I was making about this drift that you're talking about towards what you call competitive authoritarianism, one is, of course, the entire intellectual edifice on which what we thought were the principles on which the, the foundation, on which the edifice of a peaceful, <coughs> prosperous, and democratic societies were built and sustained is undergoing a process of uh, transition all over the world, not just. Uh, so as a result, Modi being a astute politician himself, that in fact, uh, I would not expect him not to be sensitive to that process and only take a certain model yes. of democracy. So that's one. Uh, now, do you see this? As you said, he's resilient. You will see the. Uh, but the BJP, as a, as a as a political organization, does not hide the fact of this Hindu resurgence, and there banking on it and they're, uh, you know, it's becoming a, a political asset on which they are winning elections. So as a result, you know, some of these clampdowns that you're talking about, especially with the, uh, with, uh, the NGOs, do you think it has something to do with a kind of a perception that the West had as soon as Modi rose, that they would, he would go exactly on the side of what the West expects him to do? But India is too large to go to any one particular agenda. So India obviously has its own agenda. So as a result, there a backlash or backslide of that in terms of the Western perception. And then you see, uh, you know, if you read Western press today, that they are much more uncomfortable with the uh, with the rise of Modi than they were before. So would you would you see that perception partly uh, contributing to that? Uh, that image and what you call this uh, you know, uh, competitive authoritarian, authoritarianism, the nomenclature that the Western scholarship and media use. Yeah, <laughs> so in some senses your first part of your question is not a question, it's a, it's a comment, right? You, you're kind of in agreement with what I have said. Yeah. Uh, the second part, I agree. I, you know, my view is that uh, the West, and I, I, I have knowledge, insider knowledge, the West is not very happy at all with the way in which uh, things are happening. But uh, Mr. Modi has a sweet spot because, uh, you know, even before he arrived, India was the third largest economy in the world on purchasing power parity terms. It has a certain amount of economic resilience. If you have to contain China, you can't see any other country in the firmament. So there are, you know, even people like Joe Biden and others have ultimately to come to India. And therefore, India cannot solve its problems with, with outside powers, nor can outside powers, as you rightly said. Uh, I mean, I have done a lot of work on economic policy that suggests that uh, India's own way of thinking always has a very important way 
uh, whether it is foreign policy decisions, whether it was the balance of payments crisis of 1991. I've done serious research on these issues, or the balance of payments crisis of 1966, two very vulnerable economic moments. Uh, India has not always been perfectly non-aligned, but India was able to extract more concessions out of Soviet Union than Warsaw Pact countries did, right? Uh, there was a time when India was able to attract concessions from both the United States and the Soviet Union because the United States thought that India was democratic and the Soviets thought that they were non-aligned. So until about 1962 or 63, India was getting benefits on both sides. So I completely agree with you that that, that uh, kind of admiration for India is beginning to decline. And I also agree with you that uh, they might find friends in Mr. Putin, but Mr. Putin can't really help India because he's not going to fight against China, right? So the world has changed and India has to live with the United States as its number one relationship right now. And if it does that, uh, the Americans and the Indians are both vulnerable. That uh, the Americans are vulnerable because they can't go to any other country apart from India. The Indians are vulnerable because now they will have to depend more and more on their weaponry. You know, there is a port in Hambantota, there is a port in Gwadar. So all of that will lead to this scenario. So the sum total of all that is that I don't think international prestige <coughs> is going to bring down Mr. Modi. Because those battles are being fought in the vernacular media, inside of India, through uh, new technologies and benefits. And their uh, like in the past, it has to be an internal struggle. But yes, on the margin, I mean, I, I saw the, whatever there was, there was this, what what of democracies was it that Joe Biden did? The, the summit. Democracy summit. It was such a failure. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think that the world will be able to bring any pressure on Mr. Modi. If there is a pressure that comes, it has to come from inside. And it is happening at a time when a lot of social forces who can win that pressure are being, are being completely squeezed. The political parties have not even worked very nicely with people who were able to bring that pressure. But the manner in which these attacks are taking place, and I even have friends in the BJP who tell me that a lot of people are unhappy with the way in which things are happening. They are damn unhappy. Uh, so I'm not sure whether the pack of cards will crumble because you know, even Julius Caesar had his day, right? He was assassinated by Brutus. So, uh, so whether it will happen from there or whether it will happen from the outside, but, but, but this kind of an attack on the plural nature of the state and society, in my view, is not sustainable for a very long period of time because of India's 10,000 year old history of which what we call Hinduism is an integral part. I think no other religion has learned to live with diversity as much as our religion. Okay. Can we take the last question we can take? Because we don't have time. Yeah, we, maybe we can take two questions. Two, okay. It's very short. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahul. Uh, I am uh, basically a media guy. Uh, uh, I was the active uh, media in Nepal for the last uh, 32 years and then uh, I recently retired uh, to, after serving the United Nations for 20, year, 20 years over here. So my question is basically related to the media issues and uh, I was bit, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to ask you that how is uh, this competitive authoritarianism is uh, especially the Modi government is dealing with uh, the media sector to bring in his fold? What are the tools, the strategies, I mean, the things that he's using to, 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 to mold them into his fold uh, side? Yeah. yeah. And maybe the last question as well. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful question. I'm also like a media guy. Uh, my question is actually, there's a rise of, there was a rise of liberalism, now there's a rise of right. There's a rise of authoritarianism. So, like 2008 financial crisis created this, all those Trump wave and everything. So, what was the factor that caused the rise of right in India? So, was it the same financial crisis or other factors that is creating this kind of cognitive authorities in India? Thank you. Great question. 
my my view is that uh, the rise of the right was already happening and within the right i think there was a fair amount of difference so there are a lot of things that prime minister vajpayee did which the congress party could never do so for example so mr vajpayee and mr modi are diametrically opposite if you've seen the movie kashmir files uh, which i think many of you will be scared to see uh, you will find that the name of gandhi vajpayee nehru are taken in the same way in one of the dialogues that we I mean, they're not called anti national but that and it was like really publicized by the prime minister right so i you know when the when the bjp came to power i'm sure the rss got stronger but but mr vajpayee was the person who could invite general musharraf to agra do a summit uh, the extent to which kashmiri muslims felt comfortable under mr vajpayee never happened in the history of independent india and uh, this kashmiriya jammuiya uh, they he started the soft borders so indian kashmiri muslims went to pakistan kashmir came back and they had no desire to go to pakistan and life became much more normal now the way in which mr modi is handling it is exactly the opposite i mean mr vajpayee was so successful that mr dr manmohan singh exactly followed that policy it was not started by rajiv gandhi it was not started by narsimha rao it was actually its founder was prime minister vajpayee uh so a lot of people think that you know finance capital globalization i mean all of these things probably help because there's a lot of unemployment and when you have a lot of unemployment and you need people and you say that muslims are bad and pakistan is bad it's one way in which people can be mobilized because they think that you know we have to do this for the nation you know so it's a it's a mobilizer of frustration of venting one's frustration but i don't think that that is the reason i think the reason really is that the rss and the right wing within the rss has consolidated itself over a period of time during the period of which the congress party has not held a single election proper election to its presidency at the national level at the state level at the district level even after that it gets 15% of the votes it used to get now probably it gets 10% tomorrow it will be on 5% after doing nothing it would get 15% of the votes right so imagine what would have happened if the congress and there you can't blame mr modi so i think what the congress party did in the past that professor shrestha was talking about uh, you know the congress party was called the congress system because it had all kinds of ideologies that debated there was the right wing within the congress and the left wing within the congress uh, there was sardar patel who was important there was also netaji subhash chandra bose jawarlal nehru he was like leftists there was jayaprakash narayan who was also a radical socialist but all of these people performed within the same party and that's why rajni kothari called it the indian political system rather than a conventional party now from that kind of an indian political system type of party which almost gave a voice to everybody where you know nehru's candidate could lose an election to the presidency where gandhi ji's candidate could lose the president you now become a courtier right like even letting rahul gandhi go has become a problem so i would blame a lot to the disorganization of the congress party and then slowly the bjp has won power it began you know who opened the babri masjid it was rajiv gandhi who opened the babri masjid now you can't complain <laughs> if mr hadwani went and broke it and therefore you know the congress has also played soft in the war i keep telling my friends in the congress that you know if there is a big fire and you open a small fire it's not going to douse the fire fire if it's a certain kind of fire you have to put water on it if it's another kind of fire you have to put sand on it you have to first understand the nature of the fire and fortunately water and sand are available in india because that is india's 10000 year old tradition but you know congress is lighting a small fire can they beat the bjp and the rss which has already lit but the bjp rss story is also more complicated i would give credit to mr vajpayee for many things that he did and coming to your question regarding the media i am really not an expert on the media but uh, i would call media drift because there have not really been any major legislations but uh, almost everybody knows that Uh, it's very difficult to publish certain kinds of things i mean i was myself impressed that i could publish in the hindu that piece if you ever get to read uh, but um, 
but media has been severely challenged and and uh, recently as you know mr adani is going to trying to buy some 30% of the stake of ndtv which is a free source um, but since i'm not an expert on the media i will not make any uh, very sort of conclusive statements i would all that i would say is that i would go with the idea that media has been gagged but it's not completely out of control i mean i could get published in the news so yeah okay so uh, as we are at the end of uh, the session um, i would like to thank professor rahul for his eloquent and uh, also radiant uh, point of view uh, with regard to how india is deviating from its uh, uh, democratic tradition and at the same time i would like to thank the audience for their pertinent curiosities right so uh, with these words i would like to declare that the session has been over or ended thank you thank you thank you thank you so your speaker wonderful audience uh, we are really grateful for this wonderful session uh, we'll break break for 10 to 15 minutes tea break and get back to the second session thank you enjoy it